um, I know we already prayed, but if you wouldn't mind, can we, can we stand again and, and pray tonight? I want God to do something tonight. Um, I know this is Christian education night, um, and this will be lesson three on prayer. Uh, but more important than anything I can say tonight is what God can do by his spirit. And let's just pray. Let's ask God to do a work tonight. Jesus, in your name, God, I pray, God, that your presence and your spirit would move tonight, God. Lord, that it would not just be a transfer of information, God, but by your word and by your spirit, God. Uh, let there be an impartation, God, uh, of faith uh, and understanding, Jesus, uh, in this place tonight, God. Uh, Lord, let there be clarity, Jesus, uh, of our position, Lord, uh, in your spirit, God, in you, God. Uh, let there be an understanding, God, of what prayer is and what prayer is for, God, and why we pray, God. Speak to me tonight, God. Speak through me tonight, God, and speak to everyone here, Lord God. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for it, and we praise you, God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You can be seated. Um. This, this world has a different view of prayer, uh, certainly than we do, and, and even than the world had just a few years back. Um, not too long ago, I heard an advertisement, a commercial on the radio, and it, it kind of upset me. It was for a, um, a company that finds candidates for businesses that need to hire people. And... During this commercial, the ad said, you don't have to just post your jobs online and pray that you'll find the right candidate. You don't have to post and pray anymore. We'll find you a candidate within 24 hours that's qualified. And what were they saying? What were they saying? What was the point of it? They're saying that prayer is ineffective they're saying that prayer is a waste of time. They're saying that prayer is nothing more than just wishing or hoping. That's the attitude of the world towards prayer these days. See, and if we're not careful, we can catch ourselves saying things like, oh, I, I, I pray it's not going to rain tomorrow. And the question comes back, well, did you? Did you pray? The Bible says that Joshua prayed, and the sun and the moon stood still. You're probably familiar with it. Israel was at war with the Amorites, one of their greatest enemies, and they were winning the battle. But the sun was setting, and it was getting dark. If the sun set, if it got dark, the enemy would have been able to escape and regrouped, and no doubt, sometime later, could have come back and would have come back and attacked Israel again. But Joshua prayed, and the Bible says the sun and the moon stood still for the better part of a day. It didn't get dark. And they were able to completely defeat their enemies. Now, I've, I've heard personal testimonies of people that were in the path of a tornado, directly in the path, and they prayed and the tornado changed its course. Just a few months ago, we heard from this pulpit testimonies of someone that was in the direct path of a hurricane where it was going to make landfall. And they prayed, and the church prayed, and the hurricane turned and went back out to sea. The Bible says that Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. See, we have to be careful about our attitude towards prayer, how we think about prayer. I, I, I don't think it's a stretch to, to say that if you're not confident that God hears you when you pray and confident that he's going to answer then you're not praying, at least not the way you should. 
in 1 John 5, and this is the first scripture on, on your study sheets, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we desire of him. So we need to be careful of the attitude we have when we pray. Um, so we're going to look at some scriptures about how we should pray and why we should pray. And, and a lot of these things we're already doing. A lot of these things I was doing before I studied on this. But by talking about it, by teaching about it, by thinking about it, we can go from the things that we're doing out of habit or routine, and we can do them with intention. We can do them with understanding. Now, in the book of James, chapter 4, it says, Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. See, when we pray, we can ask amiss. Um, a while back, I remember, I remember an evangel evangelist um, who told about the time when he was preaching. I think it was a youth revival. He was preaching, and at the altar call, there was one particular young man that came up to the altar, and, and this young man was praying, and he was crying, and he was praying, and just sobbing. So this evangelist went over and talked to him and said, is there something, something specific you're praying about that I, that I can pray with you? And, and this young man looked up t through the tears and said to the evangelist, I want to be the quarterback on the football team. True story. Now, that's one thing that we can put in the ask a miss column. Um, it says, you ask a miss that you may consume it upon your lusts. So does that mean that praying for ourselves is asking a miss? I think a, a lot of people may think that. Um, but we read in the Bible that Hannah prayed and prayed and prayed for a son. She was asking for something for God to give her a son. So that was something for herself. She said, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. But she prayed so strongly and so diligently that she couldn't speak anymore. The priest thought she was drunk. But God answered her prayer and gave her a son, which was the prophet Samuel. Now, Samuel is one of the few people in the Bible that we don't read about that ever turned back on God. In fact, um, a pastor mentioned a couple weeks ago that the Bible says of Samuel that none of his words fell upon the ground. That means every one of his prophecies, every one of the prophecies spoken through Samuel came to pass. So this prayer of Hannah that she prayed for herself must have been according to the will of God. King Hezekiah um, in the Old Testament, he was sick and was going to die. He prayed. He asked God. God granted him 15 more years. That was a prayer for himself, but that was in the will of God. Um, the Bible tells us to pray for healing if we're sick. So asking amiss is not just referring to praying for ourselves. Asking amiss is referring to us with an attitude of selfishness, praying selfishly. The same scripture, James 4, 3 in the NLT says, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So the Bible tells us that we can pray for ourselves, but selfish prayer with a selfish attitude is asking amiss. 
Now, how else should we pray? And James 1, 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. See, if we don't know what to pray for and how to pray, one of the first things we should do is ask God. It's a good idea when you start to pray, when you get down to your prayer time. One of the first things to ask God is, Lord, what do you want me to pray about? Lord, bring to my mind and my heart the things that you want me to pray for, that you're burdened for. Ask. It says, ask of God that give it to all men liberally. So in John 14, 13 through 14, it says, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. See, the highest goal of our prayers should be to bring glory to God. And when you pray for something, when you pray for anything, when you pray for healing, when you pray for someone else, and God answers. It gives him glory. That's the prayer. That's the, the purpose, the highest purpose of our prayer. And it wouldn't be a bad idea that, that when we pray to just think about that. How is this going to give glory to God when God answers? Um, how should we pray? John fifteen seven says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So part of the qualification of prayer is that we need to abide in him, and his words abide in us. The, the, the Bible quizzing, they're going to remember those scriptures for the rest of their lives. Those words are going to abide in them. Um, what does it mean to abide in him? Abide is... A primary verb, it means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. If that's not talking about prayer, it means to continue, to dwell, endure, to be present, to remain, stand, and tarry. We need to abide in God. It means we need to walk in the Spirit. We need to be led by the Spirit. In Acts 17, it says, For in him we live and move and have our being. See, to abide in God means when God is our focus. It's our reason for being. When God is our goal, when it's our goal to lift him up and give him glory. When he's the one that we depend upon, we abide in him. When we put God first in our decisions, we're abiding in him. And he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. His word abides in us when his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we base our decisions and our attitudes on the word of God, then his word abides in us. How should we pray? Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And then in John 15, 8, it says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. See, when we ask God for things, and those things bear fruit in the Spirit, if those things bear fruit, God will answer those things that we ask him for because when we bear fruit, he's glorified. Again, it gives glory to God gives glory to God. 1 John 3, 22 says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So 
for God to answer our prayers, we need to keep his commandments. Not that, that we earn anything by keeping his commandments, but when we keep his commandments, we're doing what's pleasing to God, what's pleasing in his sight. We please God, and then he will answer. Philippians 4, 6 says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So when we pray, we need to be thankful. We need to pray with thanksgiving. By faith, we can see the answer to our prayer. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. By our faith, we can see the answer to our prayers. And we can thank God for it. Because we know if he hears us, we know that if we pray according to his will, he's going to answer. And we can pray and thank him and pray with thanksgiving. And what does it say if we thank God before we actually see the answer? I mean, it, it shows him that we believe. It shows him that we have faith. It's a demonstration of our faith to God if we pray in thanksgiving. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, same scripture again, and I have this down several times, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. So if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, one way we can be sure that we're asking according to his will is we can pray for what the Bible tells us to pray for. Pray for what God tells us to pray for. Uh, some examples I have down here. Scripture tells us to pray for our enemies and those who persecute us. I mean, if we pray for those who are not being nice to us, if we pray for those who are persecuting us, the Bible says that. We should do that. So we're praying according to God's will. God's going to answer that prayer. Uh, one, one of the situations that I sometimes have problems with is driving in rush hour traffic. It's sometimes hard for me to deal with. And if somebody cuts me off and, and then waves at me with one finger, if you know what I mean, <laughs> and I say, Lord, bless that person. They need a blessing, God. Then God's going to answer because I'm praying according to the word of God. See, we need to pray with the understanding. We need to pray knowing that we're praying for God's will. The Bible also tells us to pray for laborers in the harvest. Pray for laborers, not only those that are laboring, but to send more laborers. Those that are teaching home Bible studies, those that are witnessing, those that are going to prison ministry. We know God's going to answer because his word tells us to pray for that. Pray for the ministry. Pray for our pastor. Pray for the leadership of the church. Pray for laborers in the harvest. Harvest. The Bible tells us in Matthew to pray that we do not enter into temptation. And again, the Bible tells us specifically to pray for ministers, pastors, and leaders. That, that's in Colossians 4.3 and also 2 Thessalonians 3.1. The Bible tells us to pray for government authorities, to people that are in authority in the government. A lot of times in pre-service prayer, we have that up there. It shines on the screen that we should pray for those in our government, the local government, the regional government, and national government. We should pray for our president. We should pray for the mayor of the town. 
And again, we can have confidence that God's going to answer because we're praying according to his will. The Bible tells us to pray for relief from affliction in James 5.13. Pray. If you're afflicted, pray for that. And you can be confident that God's going to answer because he tells us to pray for it. The Bible tells us to pray for healing. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. When we pray, we can pray with 100% confidence that God's going to hear us and bring an answer because that's what he tells us to pray for. And again, it, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. One of, one of the first steps uh, to a deeper level of prayer is to move away from praying for ourselves and our own needs and instead praying for others, for other people, for others' needs. Um, simply, that's called intercession. The definition of intercession is the action of intervening on behalf of another or the action of saying a prayer on behalf of another person. And that's a simple definition, but intercession goes de much deeper than that. It involves our whole being praying for another person. I found this quote, and, and I really like it. It, it kind of captures the, the, the spirit of intercession and what that means when we intercede for other people. It says, intercession involves taking hold of God's will and refusing to let go until his will comes to pass. I mean, that's powerful. Think about that. You take hold of God's will and you don't let go until it comes to pass. So that's why the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. It not only means it doesn't necessarily mean pray every second of the day, but it means don't stop praying. Just because you haven't seen the answer doesn't mean it's not on the way. Don't stop praying about something, about someone, for someone. Pray without ceasing. See, when Daniel prayed, Daniel interceded for, for the entire nation of Israel. He prayed for the nation. And the answer didn't come. And he prayed the next day. And he prayed the next day. And nothing happened. Daniel kept praying. After 21 days of nothing happening, an angel visited and told him his prayer was heard the first day. What if he stopped praying on the 20th day? What if he stopped? We need to pray without ceasing. If it's God's will and you've prayed it, keep praying until it happens. Hallelujah. Intercession is, is really a spiritual battle. It's waged in the spirit realm. It's not, it's not in the flesh. It's not in a physical strength. It's not in man's wisdom. It's a spiritual battle waged in the spirit realm. And we need the whole armor of God. That's, that's why it, it's so true what, what Brother Dobbs told us about to pray in the morning, to start your day with prayer, to put on the armor of God. Like, like Pastor said, it doesn't make sense to go through the whole day in battle and get beat up and wounded and injured and come home and clean your wounds and then put on your armor. Right? Start the day with prayer and put on that armor. Intercession is also, it's standing in the gap. It's standing in the gap for someone, just like Moses did, just like Abraham did. They interceded. They went before God on behalf of an entire nation. Moses interceded more than once for the nation of Israel. They, they rebelled against Moses and against God. 
God was going to destroy the whole nation. And Moses interceded for the nation, went to God, and God didn't destroy the nation. God listened to his intercession. Abraham interceded for, for well, you know the story. God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham said, if there's 50 righteous people, would you spare, spare the city? And then 40 and 30 and 10. But Abraham's intercession caused God to send an angel and take Lot and his family out of the city before it was destroyed. The only righteous people in the city. In Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. But it takes people to do that. God's people. Ezekiel 22.30 said, And I sought for a man among them that should make should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Who knows but whether we are called for this time, for this land. Another step to a deeper level of prayer is to be in tune with the Spirit when we pray. Um, over the years, many times in prayer meetings, uh, that we've had prayer meetings, th this isn't always the case, but I noticed a lot of times that women will be able to enter into deep prayer and intercession before men. That kind of puzzled me. I questioned that. I, I prayed. I said, God, what am I missing? What, why is it not always, but sometimes it seemed more natural for women to intercede and to pray in the spirit and to enter into that intercession? And, and God answered with one word. He said, emotions. Now, if, if you've if you're married or if you've read any books on marriage or any books on the psychology, uh, psychological differences between men and women, you, you'll, you'll know that women tend to go by emotions and feelings. And men tend to go more by logic and thinking. We tend to think, at least I had always thought of God as all-knowing. God knows everything. He, he, he thinks. But see, God has emotions. We're made in the image of God. And our emotions are an image of God's emotions. We think of God as emotionless, but God has many emotions. Ours is an image of his. So some of God's emotions, if you read the scripture and think about it, in Matthew 23... Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I mean, that's an emotional appeal. John 11, when Jesus Therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. In the book of Mark, chapter 6, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He was moved with compassion. Matthew 15, then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, 
I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat, and I will not send them the way fasting lest they faint in the way. Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. Joy. God has all these emotions. I've lifted, listed several more in scriptures that show God has anger. God has laughter, compassion. God has grief, love, hate, jealousy, and as we just read, joy. The Bible talks about David being a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, 22, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. The greatest thing God had to say about David was that he was a man after his own heart. See, Solomon was much wiser, much richer than David, the kingdom was at peace during Solomon's reign, yet it's David who's remembered as the greatest king of Israel because he was a man after God's own heart. Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes that you shall keep my judgments and do them. See, the purpose of the Holy Ghost is not just to guide you into all truth, but it's to give you a new heart. Romans 8.26 tells us, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I never really saw it this way before, but it's the Scripture is not only saying that we know not what we should pray for, and it's not so much that we don't know what to pray for, but it's that we don't know what to pray for as we ought. See, we know that a person needs to be saved, right? We know that. But can we feel the compassion that God had to cause him to go and die such a painful death to purchase their salvation? When we pray, can we feel that? See, we, we know that people need healing. We, we know that. But can we feel the love that God had that would cause him to go to the scourging post and have his flesh ripped off his back for their healing? Can we feel that when we pray? We know that backsliders need to turn back to God. But can we feel the agony that God has when one of his children turns away from him? I just wonder if that could be at least a part of what Paul was referring to when he said, oh, that I might know him in the fellowship of his suffering. See, we can't enter into the depth of prayer that we need and that God wants unless we can feel God's emotion and feel what God feels. In 1 Corinthians 14, 15, it says, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So not only understanding, but spirit. Now, if you notice in the scripture there, the word spirit is not uppercase, it's lowercase. 
And generally, that means that the, the writer was not referring to the Holy Spirit. I will pray with the Spirit <laughs> where my emotions come from. And I will pray with the understanding also. <sighs> Too often we pray only with the understanding. We go through our list. We have a list of things we need to pray for. We need to pray with our spirit also. We need our understanding and our spirit to be in tune with God's spirit when we pray. If we can not only know what we should pray for, but also feel what God feels, praying in the spirit, our prayers are going to be more powerful our prayer lives will be transformed. It's not going to be just a list of things. So uh, on the last page of the lesson there, I have uh, some homework for you. <laughs> um, it's, it's a prayer that Jesus prayed. Um, Usually when we want to learn how to pray, you know, we go to the scripture when the disciples ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he prayed, our Father, which art in heaven. And that's a perfect example of prayer. And we can talk about that and we can take it apart and teach on it. But in chapter 17 of the book of John, the whole chapter is a prayer that Jesus prayed. And it's right before he was betrayed and crucified. Um, Jesus stops. He knows what's coming. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the agony he's going to go through. And he prays for his disciples. He prays that they will be kept he prays that they won't be destroyed. He prays that the things he, he taught them would stay with them. See, it's a long, detailed, emotional prayer. And what, what I want us to do is to sometime this week read John 17. And as you read it, think about who is Jesus praying for and what is he praying for? Why? Is he praying the things he's praying? And what does he feel? What does he feel while he's praying this? It's a great example for us. Um, This turned off on me. <laughs> I want to talk just a little bit also about faith. Um, we know that it's by our faith that our prayers are answered. We know that we have to have faith for God to answer our prayers. Sorry about that.
So we know that we need to have faith to be saved and for God to answer our prayers. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that, is he, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So my mind says, okay, we need faith. Well, how much faith do we need? Then Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. A mustard seed is small. It's, it's very small. It's the very beginning or start of a mustard tree. But that mustard seed has everything in it needed, assuming soil, water, sunlight. It has everything needed to become a great, a great tree. See, that's the faith we need. We need the faith that's the very beginning of faith. All things are possible to him that believeth. In the book of Mark, chapter 9, we read about a man who had a son that was possessed of a devil. And it says, And oft times it, it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But he asked Jesus, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. That statement, well, it, it bothered me a little because he's saying I believe but help me because I don't believe so I looked at that and, and the word believe and unbelief are both derived from the same original Greek word and it really means Lord I believe and I have unbelief so we tend to think that that man was saying, Lord, I have, I believe a little bit, but help me to believe more. But if that's what he meant, why didn't he say what he meant? Could it be that when he said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief? Could he have been talking about two different things? See, I can believe, I can believe that God can do anything. I know God can do anything. I believe God can do anything. But sometimes I'm just not so sure he will. Could that be what he meant when he said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Because he believed and he had unbelief, but yet God answered his prayers. In Matthew 9, we read, When Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he's come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. He didn't say, do you think I'm going to do it? He said, do you believe that I'm able to do it? They said unto him, yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. Matthew 8, and believe, and behold, there came a leopard and worship, a leper, not leopard, <laughs> a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou will, if thou will, Thou canst make me clean. He didn't know if he would, but he knew he could. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was clean. 
See, believing that God is able to do anything is the very beginning of faith. That's the mustard seed of faith. Like I said, a lot of times we believe that God can do something, but we're not sure he will. So immediately we disqualify ourselves from receiving what we pray for, and sometimes we don't even pray. Well, in these examples, these people didn't know whether God was going to answer their prayer or not, but they knew he could. They believed that he was able to. That's the mustard seed of faith. It, it's, it could be small, but it contains everything that is needed to grow what the Bible calls great faith. And if we believe God is able, then he can do what we ask him to do. Hallelujah. Let's, let's stand. We're going to take a, a few minutes and we're going to pray and then we'll be dismissed. Let's just take, take several minutes and pray about the things that God is speaking to us right now. Jesus, we just thank you for your word.